Hello and welcome to my channel. We are here today to talk about a new Swift proposal, the proposal about function builders. Swift has always aimed to facilitate the creation of great libraries with great APIs. One interesting aspect of library design is providing solutions to domain-specific problems with what it's called a domain-specific language or DSL. That's the topic of today's Swift Evolution video, where we're gonna take a look at the pitch for function builders. The proposal document itself is a great document to read, goes into detail on implementation and gives some general theory about DSLs. So if you want to go deep in this topic, I recommend you to read it. One example of a DSL, it's a language like SQL or GraphQL. They are languages made for a specific domain. In this case, querying a relational database or querying a graph respectively. This is what it's called an independent DSL. And the inconvenience is that they are not easy to use from another environment. In our case, it's not that convenient to use from our Swift code bases. You need to have specific libraries and that you can use, for example, in a, in a stringlified way. And of course, people doesn't want that. They want like proper type, a proper function system with proper APIs. Instead of that, there is another approach that it's the so-called embedded DSL, which uses the host language, in our case, Swift, to design an API that may look quite different from the standards of the language. There are many examples of this, but one great example to look at is the point-free Swift HTML library, which is an embedded DSL and thus it uses all the power of Swift to create HTML documents. If you take a look at the examples provided on the repo, you can see how this library, it helps us to create an HTML document with a body and H1 where we pass a string and P. So, this is an embedded DSL. It uses fully the, the language. All the things that you see is language constructs. There are specific nodes that define the HTML document and you have different functions for them where you can pass parameters. You can nest and create this tree-like structure. This provides safety because thanks to the type system, we only accept a specific parameters to specific functions. So the HTML that we're creating, it's always safe and we cannot do weird things. Like for example, using the list item inside a div that doesn't work because it's not proper HTML because it needs to be inside an unordered list or an ordered list. So this is the kind of things that embedded DSLs provide. The HTML example for an embedded DSL, it's actually the example that the proposal shows. And the aim of this proposal is to basically, if you take a look, this is fine, this is valid Swift, but if you think about this is the type of code that you need to write constantly in a lot of different places if you are working with HTML. In this case, you don't want to, for example, have to start using commas everywhere and these dots here. There is a lot of effort put into designing these APIs to make them syntactically appealing. This proposal introduces a way to improve this. It's obviously highly motivated by Swift UI, the recently announced new UI framework for Apple platforms. You can check out all about it on my video that I released just the day of the announcement. And this is because Swift UI has a beautiful syntax to create views. You can check this example that is the first thing that you see on the Swift UI website, and you can see how beautiful it is to read. It's literally beautiful to read. There is no extra commas, there is no extra symbols or nesting, or you don't have to use arrays to embed things in a list. It's beautiful. And that's the key that this proposal is trying to aim for. And yes, this means that Swift UI, it's actually using not officially accepted Swift features. So I'm happy that the people at Apple is already proposing this in for Swift community approval. It's gonna be super interesting to see the discussions on how the community thinks that we can improve it. I'm not gonna go into the politics of that because people has been triggered a lot by this decision. We should just aim to get this in in the best way possible. It's important to understand that this proposal doesn't, doesn't introduce a specific DSL. Like this example here about the HTML, it's not what the proposal is actually wanting to, to do. Like we're not have, gonna have this in Swift. What we're gonna have is a new feature on the language that allows us developers to implement this kind of DSL, which is much more powerful. We don't want a specific DSLs on Swift. We want the ability for us to create whatever we can imagine. To make a good DSL, the goal of this proposal is to allow a syntax that gathers data on each step when following usual syntax rules that wouldn't. In this case, if you can see here this P that you can imagine it's a function where you pass a closure with something in, you can see that nobody is, is storing the result of this P. Like if this is a function that returns some, something, 
nobody is storing that result. The same for this string, which is like, well, are we passing it as a parameter? So you can see that DSLs and the goal of this is to allow the syntax to be nicer and still be valid Swift. Only on these specific points, in this case when we are building an HTML, not across the language. We don't want this kind of syntax to be spread across the language. It's just when you know that you are working specifically with a piece of thing that needs a special syntax to be super nice and to be super easy to do. In this case, HTML or the Swift UI example. This proposal introduces the concept of function builder types. These are types that are annotated with this function builder attribute and that implement a series of ad hoc methods that transform the data that they need on the specific DSL. By ad hoc methods, I mean that there is no protocol to implement, as with all Swift features, there is a set of known methods that the compiler, or in this case, this specific annotation, they know that they are expecting, so you need to implement this series of methods. This is done for many reasons, but the main one is to support a flexible set of methods with different kinds of overloading, something that it wouldn't be possible if we just say that we wanted to implement the protocol. In the case of the HTML, you can see how we have this HTML builder, which is this builder type that is just a struct that is annotated with this annotation. And then we have all these specific build functions that are these ad hoc methods I was talking about that re receive the data from the code that the user has written, and here they transform it to what the DSL is expecting. There is many combinations of these build methods and you can use ones or the others for specific cases. The proposal goes in, into a lot of detail about this, so you should read it if you are interested. But the key thing here is that once you have this function builder type, you can use it as an annotation, as displayed here, in closure parameters and other places. This will indicate to the compiler that the statement and expressions made inside this function, so the, the, the ones that the user is writing, in this case, this body function or, the, or this deep function, is expecting a closure with statements inside. The compiler knows now that all these things inside the closure need to be passed into the builder type, and the builder type is going to be able to rewrite and gather the data needed for, at the end of this closure, return the specific type that it's expected, in this case, this HTML node. Thanks to this feature, what is happening is that at compile time, this piece of Swift code gets rewritten into this piece of code, which is obviously much more ugly to, to read, but we don't see this, like this is all under the hood. So as you can see, we still have our original things like this, if that we added, it's still there, but then the code inside there, it's wrapped into this HTML builder and the HTML builder has a chance to transform what we have been given, do whatever it needs to gather the necessary data for at the end of the day, you see that there are partial results gathered and finally it's going to construct them and return, the, in this case, the HTML type that the library is using. This is an interesting case of what this feature needs to take into account because even if the proposal goes into much detail, one interesting example is the if. It means that when you are gathering the data, this data might not be there because this part of the code may not run if this if condition it returns false, which means that you need to take into account that this part of the code is optional as opposed to other ones that they are not optional unless you want it to. So to handle if statements, this proposal introduces different ways of, of doing it depending on which method you implement. You can pick and choose what is best for you. You can actually say, okay, I deal with an optional or no, I want I want to deal with like a tree-like structure if there are nested things. You can actually pick what is best for your DSL. This flexibility to be so specific is really important. I imagine that this is what allowed them to get good performance on Swift UI as it allows them to know exactly which types are being created, what is static and what is dynamic data, and I think this is huge for optimizations. I'm really excited to have this in Swift. There are, have been previous threads on the Swift Evolution forums to discuss improvements on, on the language to support better DSLs, and this one looks like it's really powerful. So I'm really excited to have this, and the best thing is that we already have an example, which is Swift UI. You have an example there of how powerful a DSL can be, and how the language can be so integrated that it's beautiful to write. It's true that there are limitations currently in the proposal. At the time of recording this, for example, there is no support for loops, and that's exactly why Swift UI has this weird for each construct that you need to use. And also the issue that Swift still doesn't support variadic generic types, which means that you need add overloads 
repeated a lot of them in case that you want uh, variadic arguments but you want them to generic because you want to keep the type which is for example crucial for Swift UI so this is one of these things that it's will be super nice to have it's on the pipeline and maybe if we add this and we have Swift UI being used a lot it will actually give us more reason and give Apple more reason to put resources on this and actually implement these generic features that we have been wanting for a while sooner rather than later. The good thing is that none of this is a road blocker. If we accept this feature, we can work introducing the for loops in the future or the variadic genetics. All of these things can be improved. And the good thing is that because this, all of this is a compile time feature, there doesn't seem to have any minimum requirements of operative systems. Or we can expand it and it's gonna be if you just update your compiler, it's just gonna work because it's all a compile time. And that's it for this video. If you learned something useful, make sure to like the video. And if you want to receive more videos like this, please subscribe and click that bell. Remember that you have the Swift UI video link in the description. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.